Hello everyone, welcome to today's online webinar series on butterfly gardening nectar plants. My name is David Rodriguez. I'm a horticulturalist with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service and we appreciate all the support that you give the Extension Service here in Bear County and San Antonio and throughout the state. Uh, the Extension Service is the educational arm of our land-grant university in Texas, Texas A&M University and College Station. And we support with a special partnership with the county, the 254 counties in our state, as well as the state. And we are funded separately uh, from the university system. This is my email address. So don't hesitate if you have any gardening or landscape related questions uh, to send me an email. So Molly Keck, our entomologist, did a wonderful job the other day talking about specific host plants for the different species and different types of butterflies there. And we're going to kind of focus today on planting majority, a handful that I selected are hardy summer perennial type plants. Okay. And let's talk a little bit about some of these perennial type plants because these are the plants that really bloom the longest period of time in order to bring in butterflies in and around uh, your landscape. So one thing I like to explain to people is do not buy on impulse when you're at the nursery and garden center. Yeah, I know a lot of these plants are very beautiful and the nursery professional will be very grateful that you're purchasing them but let's kind of slow things down and plan, plan, and plan. So the predominance of these plants that are available are typically in the springtime to early summer, and of course, fall is for planting. So try to find good quality plants, learn a little bit about them. Uh, they don't have to be in full bloom. Often we purchase plants when they're in full bloom. And sometimes you put the plants in a uh, little bit stress, when you purchase a plant in full bloom. So remember you're trying to reestablish into a, a nice container on your patio or in the landscape. So you, know, you want a, a good balance of top uh, growth of the plant and a good amount of the root system. So you don't have to buy them blooming and sometimes uh, you might even pinch or uh, trim out some of the blooms to help that plant get quickly uh, established into its new home. With the plan, you want to make sure location, location, and location. Is this plant uh, tr truly going to thrive its, in, in its best habitat in a sunny location, a shady location, an area that maybe gets morning sun and late afternoon shade, particularly in summertime? How tall is this plant going to grow? You know, the height, the width of it. Is it going to get ample sunlight when it's much more mature? ample air circulation to minimize uh, disease or insect pressure and are you able to kind of get in and around the plant uh, when you need to do some maintenance some like fertilizing like pruning replenishing the organic mulch around it we need a plan 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 and often we don't do that so slow things down and that way we can enjoy a lot of these plants that we'll be discussing here <clears throat> here's a little bit general maintenance um, and it's always good to review some of these. We kind of have to work with the native soil uh, that we have. Um, most of us have predominantly clay type soils. Uh, a lot of us have rocky soils, and then uh, some of us have sandier soils. But you have to, you know, select the right plant for the location. Not only native plants, but well adapted species that have proven the test of time. So at the most, you can do some soil mending with the native type soil, maybe 20% of a high grade finished compost mixed into the native soil. So for landscape plants, tree shrubs, or these hardy summer perennials, you just don't want to dig a crater in the ground and backfill it with straight potting mix or landscape mix, um, because where are those roots going to grow eventually? And if we overwater, if we get a, a tremendous rain event, you're going to have root rot issues with that plant. So work with what you have, amend it at the most with 20% finished compost mixed into the native soil. As a good rule of thumb for planting guidelines, uh, you want to dig the hole twice as wide or even wider than the container that it's in 
and maybe slightly an inch or so above soil grade. So uh, when the plant settles down, it's not planted too deep because tree shrubs, hardy summer perennials and many plants unfortunately get uh, planted a little bit too deep and we start getting excess soil or um, molts on the crown of the plants, which can be very detrimental to the, to the growth of that plant. You know, often we look at the top of the plant. Is it green? Is it a vigorous growth to it? Vibrant green, pretty blooms, the color of bloom that we want. But sometimes we have to examine the roots of the plant as well. You know, is it um, coming out of the container without breaking the root ball? Are the roots uh, very intertwined, uh, too tight? Are the roots white and healthy or brown and decaying? Uh, do we need to open up and loosen up those roots, massage them, open them up, maybe get a utility knife about an eighth of an inch on both sides of the root ball and cut into that root to rejuvenate them? We don't want to fertilize a lot of these plants to the uh, six months or the, or the, the next major uh, fertilizing time frame. But if you want a little bit of an insurance policy, don't hesitate to water these plants in with a good root stimulator. Just always read and follow label instructions. So that's a little bit of general maintenance on, on some of these plants and plants in general that we plant in the landscape. Uh, with hardy perennial type plants, summer color type perennials, which are the best plants to attract butterflies because they bloom such a long period of time. You know, we can have our first frost date uh, as early as Halloween, typically it's around mid-November, but mainly December, January is when most of our hardy perennial type plants uh, freeze down. Uh, some of them uh, can freeze down to the ground and so you have that ugly appearance. And a lot of us wanna start cutting back in December and January, and you possibly can for some of these plant species, but y'all know that the weather, January being the coldest month, and, and we have these days, that you wake up in the morning and you have your heater on and then by two o'clock or so we have our air condition on and we go from one extreme to the next within a week's time frame and sometimes these plants are fooled you might say particularly on mild winters and we get all this young tender growth so if you can wait and be patient most of these perennial type uh, plants if we can wait till about mid-february to early march and cut them back to the green wood. Take out the ugly look, you might say. That's typically about a third of a prune. So use sharp pruners, hand pruners or loppers, and some species of plants, if they look completely brown or deadish, uh, then do trim them down to the ground level. Uh, move the organic mulch away from them. Let the warm temperatures, particularly in March, April, warm up that soil so it can encourage that plant to come back out again. Throughout the year, we want to encourage these hardy perennial plants to have blooms, blooms, blooms. So possibly two up to three times a year on most of these species, no later than early September, when the plant's about 80% spent bloomed, when flowers are kind of ugly, and go ahead and trim them back again. You know, it could be four to six inches from the top, typically 20%, no more than one third, and just cut them back again. And every time we do that, you know, pruning is a dwarfing and rejuvenation process. Get a nicer, thicker, fuller, aesthetically pleasing plant, and then these plants bloom off the new growth. Nutrition is very important since we lack organic material in the soil. We keep the plants well mulched, and we do need to fertilize. So every major cut back as early as mid-February, early March, and if you trim two or three times a year to rejuvenate the flower cycle. I use about a half a cup of 1959 premium slow release fertilizer, not at the crown of the plant, but the, the outskirts, the drip line, you might say. Scratch it in, water it in thoroughly, and this will encourage uh, the plant to really bloom much faster and much prettier for a much, much longer period of time. Mulch, 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 the best way to aesthetically uh, have a bed looking good. I prefer the double shredded hardwood mulch, maybe with a little bit of compost in it. Wait till about May before we go into the heat of summer and coming out of the heat of summer, replenish that mulch um, in early September, two inch layer, 
a two inches minimum away from the crown of the plant twice a year, two, two, two. And that's a good way to minimize weeds, but most importantly, to help retain moisture uh, when, during the hot summer months to help cut back on your watering bill as well. And of course, never put extra soil or mulch up on the crown of any plant. So that's just some general guidelines. Let's talk about some of the plants that we might consider to bring in those butterflies to our beautiful landscape. So if you have container plants, um, uh, make sure it's a large enough size container. Use a real good potting mix, not a potting soil. Most of the good potting mix are what they call premium or growers mix that are consists of pre-moistened Canadian peat moss. Maybe cut that again with about 20% of a high grade finished compost. And of course, watch your watering and fertility of container plants, which are a little bit more different than landscape plants since you're in such a small container on the patio. So you can grow plants both on the patio as well as in your established landscape. So Molly again, Keck, our entomologist, did a wonderful job. Uh, all the species and beautiful species of butterflies and caterpillars. So let's kind of showcase some top-notch plants uh, that bring in plants to our landscapes. Uh, milkweed, um, there's a lot of species, a lot of native species besides uh, this tropical one out there. Uh, that a lot of people have really have had a lot of interest in uh, the last few years. They even have the tropical milkweed also has a unique uh, aphid that tends uh, to get on it, which is kind of pretty if you can consider an aphid uh, pretty. Uh, wonderful plant uh, to add to your um, patio uh, garden or uh, strictly uh, to your landscape. And we're not going to talk about the uh, host plants. We know that uh, the milkweeds in general, like this tropical milkweed with the a yellow and red flower, there's some that are strictly yellow as well. Uh, they're more upright. They typically about, get about 24 to 30 inches tall. So this is a specific host plant uh, for your monarch um, uh, butterfly. So we normally on uh, the tropical milkweed selection, we usually tell folks uh, no later than about November the 1st, uh, if they have not frozen down since they are perennial and should, as perennials come back the following spring, uh, let's go ahead and cut them down to the ground on November 1st. So this would be one of those uh, rare exceptions from probably October 1st to November 1st. Cut it down, uh, cut them down to the ground, uh, not like all the other ones, which we just mentioned mid-February to early March. So there's a lot of cool looking, unique, a butterfly species that come to these plants that we're going to talk about. So we're going to kind of showcase you uh, some of these plants that we've seen in and around our landscape over the years. For instance, this tiger swallowtail butterfly, and then this southern dog face uh, butterfly. Now we know that butterflies, the adults, have a their proboscis, their long mouth part. It swirls out, and it's basically similar to a straw and they suck up the nectar off the flower, what they call nectarines, which has the sugary substance of the flower. So that's where all your pollinators, be it bees and other pollinated type insects, uh, they need that sugary substance, that energy protein, you might say, uh, from the flower. So that's why it's so important to have flowers that uh, are well adapted native and give you quite a bit of uh, blooms throughout most of the spring, summer, and early fall season. It's a beautiful picture of a, a tiger swallowtail butterfly. Very beautiful. So we get an array of different. Remember, the caterpillars are specific. The mama will lay the eggs of that particular species on that particular type of plant. Uh, it feeds on it. So we're looking for adults, as we'll show you these butterfly pictures of plants in and around our landscape. This is a home run winner right here, Greg's Blue. Uh, mist flower blooms heaviest in the fall time and normally a lot of your fall blooming perennial type plants we recommend uh, like mexican mint marigold the mist flower here the uh, fall aster cigar plants we, and uh, perennial um, chrysanthemums we normally tell people around um, mid-august about the time that you trim roses back as well 
to nip these back a little bit so we can encourage new growth off these blooms so we can enjoy a lot of flowers. But there's a white uh, selection of this, but the blue one really is outstanding as we can see all these beautiful, beautiful uh, butterflies uh, around them as well. Beautiful monarch on this one, and then you can see the abundance on this, this flower as well. So this is a home one renter. It's really not the most prettiest plant to have in the landscape. The, the mist flower typically, if you trim it in mid-February and again in mid-August, possibly mid to early June or so, uh, it'll be a little bit thicker and fuller, but certainly not the prettiest plant. But when you, when you want to bring monarchs and a lot of other species of butterfly, it is a home, one, home run winner. There's so many types of salvias out there. And uh, salvias have square stem stem. They're half lip flowers, uh, hardy perennials um, as well, very aromatic uh, foliage to them. They're herbaceous perennials, kind of woody in appearance. So pruning back, particularly on the salvia gregii selection of this pink salmon looking one, they typically get about two feet or so. I think the biggest problem that people that grow a lot of perennials in general is they don't follow the guidelines of pruning. You have to prune back uh, at the right time, mulch and fertilize, so we can really enjoy blooms, blooms, blooms. And that's why we follow the 80% rule of thumb. You know, even if you cut a few flowers off, more and more flowers will come. So this plant goes by many different names, salvia gregii, autumn sage, cherry sage this is kind of a pink salmon one i really like that dark dark red one when you go out looking for different types of salvia gray guys and all the different colors that are out there a couple of uh, things to consider try to get the ones with the that this species of plant try to get the ones with the larger blooms and larger leaves. For some reason, the ones with a little bit larger leaves tend to be much, much better, like uh, Foreman's Red, which is my favorite uh, in the landscape. So the swallowtail is really uh, loving this plant right here in front of us. So we talked about three butterfly magnet plants that have been used for many years in and around commercial and residential landscapes. The next plants that we're gonna showcase our Texas superstar plants. Since we have such a deep history out of the San Antonio Barrick County program, which the 92 or so plants from the superstar program, about 90% of them have come out of this program. And the vast majority of Texas superstar plants, many of them, which has brought economic significance locally, but statewide so-called million dollar plants because a lot of these introductions we figured out working with growers, landscape contractors to find the best of the best through trials, demonstration trials, and looking at uh, how plants can be propagated and put into these commercial plant systems because we're looking for plants that bloom. And that's what we want. The more blooms we get, the prettier they look, the more we can enjoy them and also attract a lot of butterflies. So more information, on the Texas Superstar Plant Program and all the other plants that are on it uh, is on our Aggie Horticulture uh, website. So we're going to give you the triad of hardy summer color perennials of the Texas Superstar Program. Many of y'all, these plants that we'll be showing you might already have some of these. Uh, maybe y'all see them around town, particularly when you're driving around town during the hottest months of the year of June, July, and August. Everything's so hot, but these plants are performing. You're seeing the hummingbirds, the butterflies, the bumblebees, the regular bees, and they're, they're, they're doing well with the heat and, and they're just performing. That's what we're looking for when we do these uh, Texas superstar plants. Greg Grant, a great horticulturalist um, who discovered this plant off of Highway 90 and General McMullen uh, Drive in San Antonio selected this so this is a clone so when we look for esperanza which means hope we want to keep true to the gold star you know when you purchase it at the nursery which may is the ideal time to purchase all these summer color hardy perennials that we're talking about today 
is this plant should be a small plant, large yellow trumpet-like blooms, blooming its brains out and, and hunker them down for Meg through the summer heat so they can really perform real well. But this thing's a winner. It's a, a plant that gets four to five, six feet at the most. And we've seen a lot of these perennial plants, particularly when we have these real, real mild uh, winters that plants aren't cut back or they don't freeze down that are 10, 12 feet plus, and they just don't look pretty. So that's why we covered at the beginning here, pruning and fertilizing and mulching, which is a big part of successfully growing all these perennials. And really it's low input. It takes some, some effort, but very low input in general for what they give you for blooms throughout the year. So we see the beautiful swallowtail butterfly on this uh, gold star Esperanza. And remember, there's a lot of Esperanza plants out there, but without a doubt, gold star is the grand champ. Uh, tiger, uh, tiger swallowtail on this bloom here. They really do best, these plants, in the, in the landscape in a full sun location. Uh, you can grow them in, on containers in the patio, but they're much, much happier, Gold Star Esperanza, in the landscape. There's a nice picture of a pipe line, a swallowtail. So that's one of the three must of everybody uh, uh, if you don't have Gold Star. The next is firebush, you know, orange tubular like flower. So anything that has a kind of a longer flower, uh, the hummingbird or the butterfly uh, sticks their beak or their proboscis and sucks the nectar, nectar out of the flower, the sweet juice out of the flower. And firebush is um, the second of the three major um, hardy summer color perennials of the Texas Superstar uh, program. Uh, they get four to, feet, four to five feet tall in the fall when temperatures start cooling down and the days are shorter, uh, the plant turns a fire um, a color all over the foliage. They do freeze back, uh, typically to the ground. And a lot of people, even when we do the mid-February to March uh, cutback, uh, they think this plant is dead. It comes back a little bit later in the year. So what you might do around that uh, March time frame is move that organic mulch away from the crown of that plant and let the soil warm up. And if they're not out by May, May time, when it, when it really starts warming up, then you probably have to replace it. But it comes back late. Uh, some parts of the state, particularly like in the Dallas Metroplex area, they grow this type of a plant as a per annual plant, per annual plants um, that, um, it's very tender. They might grow it as a, a plant that we grow an annual type plant and replant them every year, but for the blooms and the performance of what this does, and it does pretty well on the patio as well. And you can see uh, with the zebra long wing butterfly that the butterflies like them as well. The third of the triad of must hardy summer color perennials for the landscape is Mexican bird of paradise. Uh, four to six feet tall, typically. Blooms these orange-yellow flower spikes in the heat of summer, usually starting from mid-spring to the first frost, like most other of uh, these perennial plants. And again, uh, don't let these bean pods set. That's why pruning is so important. We don't want to see seeds on any of these plants. We want to see blooms soon after we prune them back, fertilize them, and mulch them. You know, the highway department used to plant oleanders for many, many years. Now we're starting to see a lot of these Mexican uh, bird of paradise. And it goes by two or three different names, Cesopinium and a few others. Um, Pride of Barbados is another name. So this, you all have seen this plant, and then this tiger swallowtail is really enjoying it. To the left of this tiger swallowtail, we're just seeing the first uh, pods, the bean pods form on it. So again, we should have immediately start pruning these off, but you know we want every bloom to the end. So again, on all these perennial type plants, you know you're going to lose a few blooms, right? About 80% spent blossom. Bring them back, so we can enjoy blooms throughout the year. Beautiful, beautiful uh, flowers. This one has more orange than any yellow in it, but it's it's a champion. And these are the plants we want to add to our landscape. So. 
here's a couple of salvias that we're going to show you. The salvia gregii and all the different colors of salvia gregii. Uh, we've never uh, made those a Texas superstar plant, but a couple of salvias that we're going to show you next uh, have been uh, noted as Texas superstars. Henry Dolberg is a true native. Uh, the Henry Dolberg is a bluish lavender flower, very long spike flower to it. And Augustus Duberg, which is was Henry's wife, is a white one. And both of those were found by Dr. Bill Welch and Greg Grant in an old homestead family grave site. Uh, so it was a, must have been a real selection of a native salvia farinacea that was selected for many years and passed along. And then we uh, put this into the industry. So this is a must type of salvia that not only attracts butterflies and blooms immediately after you give it a new prune back, but in order to get blooms, 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 that almost look like a summer blue bonnet or a, or a kind of a lavender type uh, flower, uh, makes a nice cut flower by the way too, is prune, prune, and pruned. Henry Dubark's a winner. Look for Augustus Dubark, the white one, if you like that one as well. Attracts many butterflies, butterfly magnet, uh, you might say. And like I said, there's so many, many different salvia types that are out there, perennials. Uh, but the ones that we're showing are really the, the ones that really perform the best in and around our landscapes. This should be the number of top four of the Texas superstar plants that we've ever have put on the market. Um, I did some of my graduate work on, on its grandfather, Indigo Spires, many moons ago. And Mystic Spires is a selection of the grandfather, Indigo Spires, which is a, uh, this is even a more improved than the original Mystic Spire. This is a home run winner without a doubt. Henry Dubarg is awesome, but really of all the salvias, I think this is the best one that's ever have been put on the market because it's very tight, very compact blooms its brains out, even through a mild winter. And if you cut it back two or three times a year or so, it's unbelievable how this plant and the magnet of bees and beneficial insects and mostly important butterflies that come to it. I get people that uh, say all the time uh, during the mid to late spring, summertime, is that a lavender plant? Is that a blue bonnet from a distance? And really, it'll perform much better in the sun. It'll grow somewhat in the shade, but in order to get more uh, uh, spectacular blooms on it, uh, six hours of sunlight would really be the best for Mystic Spires salvia. Does good in a nice patio plant too, on the, and on the uh, container on the patio, and uh, maybe a combination of uh, petunias, purslane, uh, something semi-cascading throughout the summertime as well. Here are a few other hardy perennial summer uh, color plants. The next one is Duranta. Uh, some people call it Brazilian sky flower. Uh, maybe grows a little bit larger, six feet, possibly up to 10, depending on how you want to keep it kept. But six feet is a good rule of thumb. It'll take some shade, but at least four or five hours of direct sunlight. There's many colors of Duranta. Uh, this one is a kind of a combination of purple with a light a white tinge in it, a light blue, and there's some white and other shades of blue, and some have a, a little white center in them as well. Um, I kind of refer to Duranta as a kind of a semi-clavering type of a plant. It is an upright perennial, but it semi-cascades, not like a vine, but kind of semi-drapes, uh, semi-cascades, and it does attract quite a bit of insects, particularly the beneficial ones and of butterflies. Now, if you do not do the mid-August to early September cutback to potentially get more blooms for the fall, or you don't cut it back as hard, this is another added feature, is the little yellow teardrop berries that it has during the fall and winter time. So you might grow a couple of these, and you can see how well this one's performing in this half whiskey barrel. So that's kind of a cool looking thing uh, to have those berries in the fall going in the winter time. It also acts what we call like a wildscape plant. So it's also a berry uh, for the birds as well. So that's that might be an exception of the mid-August, early September 
cut back if you want to kind of get the berry production uh, for the fall time for the birds and and just that color it makes it pretty cool uh, when you do cut flowers and floral design you can mix that in uh, to your cut flowers as well but we can see this uh, beautiful butterfly on this one um a very nice and pretty another beautiful butterfly going for the nectar and kind of when we started this online gardening series back in april we did 12 months of um, nectar plants you know the biggest time uh, for the butterflies is uh, probably mid spring through the to the um, fall time september october heaviest during the late spring and summer so these are when most of these plants that we're talking about performing uh, with the most blooms a little cloudless sulfur butterfly real pretty Sulfur, a painted lady right there, very beautiful. Next plant we're going to talk about is blue plumbago. This is a top-notch Texas superstar plant. Now, looking at plum blue plumbagos all these years, there are a few uh, selections out there. Really look for the one called Royal Imperial or Imperial Blue. And that selection is probably the best one, I think. It's very full, very compact. It keeps that blue color. Some of those older selections tend to fade. Uh, the Imperial or Royal Imperial Blue really holds that blue color. Um, there is a white one. A white one will take a little bit more shade than the blue, which will take some shade, but better in, in at least six hours of sun. And again, this is a like the, all these other perennial types that we've discussed so far. Prune, 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 and you'll get a plant. And fertilize and mulch them, you get a plant that will really perform. And this blue color is so, so um, uniquely beautiful. Unique thing about the plumbago is um, it, it's not going to be a dense, compact plant. It kind of a little bit depends how you want it to be kept, but it has that. You know, not you know, shoots out a little bit, and it's very beautiful flowers to it as well. You trim it the way you like it, but it doesn't need to be real formalized, you might say. And then you get all a lot of different butterflies that potentially come to it throughout the year. And if you ever kind of check out your plants, particularly that Imperial Blue, Royal Blue selection of Blue Plumbago in the evening, you know, it ha has that moonlight effect. It has real nice shine to the uh, flowers and you know moths are typically um, more in the evening or nocturnal than regular butterflies so you you'll get some cool looking uh, moths uh, in and around your plumbago plants as well so maybe plant a few just for that if you haven't tried it, it does excellent also on the patio uh, but i think it really does best in the landscape as a well-established plant We're starting to see lantanas. There's so many, so many selections of lantanas. Probably the most popular one that blends its brains out in the heat of the summertime is this what we call a self-cleaning male sterile, sterile. That means it doesn't have any seed on it. It's called new gold. It's a low growing ground cover type that gets around a foot or so tall and a good spread. Uh, uh, to it. It needs that full sun, uh, very drought tolerant once it's established, occasionally pruning back, uh, like we've mentioned the other perennials. But this has been really a good stand the test of time, a plant that has really, really performed. Again, there's a lot of other selections of lantana, but New Gold is the only one that's made Texas superstar status. There is also a purple species one called Montevides which blooms predominantly in the winter time, um, particularly mild winters, and it'll take a little bit more shade, which is a low growing um, uh, type. And that Montevita selection is also a sterile one. Uh, so it's a really a, an outstanding performing one as well. And lantanas in general, you attract a lot of different color, like the red admiral uh, butterfly, very beautiful butterfly. And the, this one here, so uh, they're, they're magnets. Lantanas in general are magnets, but the best ones really is new gold and the purple one that blooms mainly in the fall and wintertime.
This plant here is a more of a bush type perennial plant, um, maybe a little bit denser than the Gold Star Esperanza, but they have much smaller yellow dainty like flowers. Uh, gets about four feet, five feet, the Golden Showers Trialis. And we're, we're not using this plant enough. This is a very, very uh, drought tolerant plant. Uh, once it's established, it will take some shade, but it doesn't tend to bloom as much and stay as dense. And the yellow dainty flowers are so beautiful. And uh, it really performs during these droughty times once, there, once it's established. And yes, like all the ones we've mentioned so, so far, as hardy uh, summer type perennials uh, do attract a lot of uh, different types of butterflies uh, to them as well. Uh, Lucky Star Penthes, also res uh, there are many selections of Penthes and a lot of people uh, commonly refer to Penthes as butterfly um, Penthes. And um, there's many types and old fashioned types that can get three uh, to four feet tall. Lucky Star was designated this year in 2020 as a Texas Superstar selection. So depending on what part of the state you're at, uh, this is kind of a tender type perennial, uh, possibly a perennial, uh, a per perennial that we treat as an annual. In the summer heat, it likes that early morning sun or all day filter light, and it can perform pretty good in a shady area with that uh, minimal light, uh, excellent on, on containers and patios. But try this Lucky Star selection. It doesn't grow as tall as the older varieties, typically about 12 inches or so. And you can see all the unique colors. Red is my favorite, but all the other uh, uh, star shaped flowers and clusters that they have is so attractive. Lucky Star Panthus and a beautiful plant if you haven't tried this series of Panthus uh, to your landscape. Zinnias is an annual. So we talked about perennials. We started out with uh, three perennials that, are, that have been uh, on the market for many years. And we talked to, highlighted uh, the Texas Superstar ones, particularly the top three, uh, Gold Star Esperanza, the Firebush, the Mexican Bird of Paradise, the fourth one, which I think uh, the, the um, Salvia, uh, Mystic Spires, and then the other ones. Penthes is more of a tender perennial or perennial. And this is the Xenia. Uh, Dreamland is my favorite of all the Xenias, which is an annual, okay? So you can put plants out, transplants out. Uh, you can grow them in the spring, summer, which most people do, but really, if you've never grown zinnias, particularly dreamland, in the fall, I think this is something you need to try. Uh, set out healthy transplants around mid-August. Very, very tight plant. Very Makes an excellent cut flower. It is really a butterfly magnet. And you can grow them on the patio, and as we see on the image to the left on containers, or as a border plant in your landscape. Uh, Dreamland was designated as a Texas superstar plant because it uh, blooms quite a bit, makes an excellent cut flower. It tends of all the zinnias when we have a rain event or high winds not to blow over. It stays more dense or more compact. It's not susceptible to um, powdery mildew disease. And uh, so it's, it's a reliable one and a very fun, but there's so many different types of zinnias out there from the little lily put types, the profusion, and a, and a few of those small ones that make excellent border plants as well. But Dreamland is my favorite and they attract so many, um, many different butterflies to our cut flower garden. And this is an excellent cut flower to have. You can grow two or three crops of zinnias a year as an annual, you know, uh, so you can have constant. The other one we didn't add to our presentation today, our cosmos. Uh, if you put the seeds out during the month of May, you get a lot of butterflies and you get a lot of blooms and cosmos comes in different colors as well. So I always like to add a bonus plant or so to my presentations. So we have a bonus plant today. And since our presentation is a couple days or so before Mother's Day, 
if you haven't got that uh, unique plant uh, for your mom for Mother's Day or that special lady in your life, you might consider one of our Texas Superstar roses, maybe Grandma's Yellow Rose. Um, you know, not only a plant that's going to be nice as a beautiful standalone plant on the patio in a beautiful container or in the landscape in her rose garden, you know, but uh, that's a Texas Superstar plant. If you have room, maybe look for the Belinda's Dream Rose, which is the pink one. Both of those were designated as Texas Superstar plants. And don't forget uh, to not just get a cut flower, get a plant that you can have many, many cut flowers uh, throughout the year. So we appreciate everyone being here today. Hope you learned a little bit. The key is for the most bang for your money and for the most blooms throughout the year, most of the plants that you would want to consider to bring in butterflies in and around your landscape, both adapted and native plants would be Texas Superstar Hardy Summer Color uh, Perennials without a doubt. May is probably the best time to find all these plants uh, that we talked about, get them planted, uh, hunker them down through the summer, watch the watering on them for the first hot summer to get them through the August heat. For more information on gardening and landscape, if you're not familiar, please visit our Aggie Horticulture website of the Texas A&M University System. This is the biggest website that's most present, meaning that people still love gardening and it's still our nation's number one hobby. Please utilize our Bear County Extension Service website for archived information that we have, but also other educational programs that we offer throughout the year. Plantanswers.com is a must. That's Dr. Jerry Parsons' uh, website, who's a retired extension horticulturalist. And some of these images came from his butterfly gallery. So I would really, really encourage you to go to plantanswers.com on the home page in the middle, uh, uh, click under inf on the information index under uh, galleries and click on butterfly gallery because I just gave you a teaspoon of top notch uh, butterfly plants. There's a lot, lot more images, but the main uh, images you saw are some of the best and coolest uh, butterflies that we can bring into our landscapes. Uh, don't forget uh, next week, hopefully y'all can join us uh, Tuesday, May 12th, we're going to talk about blooming trees for the landscape. I'm going to pick 10 top-notch uh, blooming trees that if you, you might really consider adding to your landscape and uh, really enjoying them as well. Thank you for today. And most of these um, online uh, presentations we do have archived. If you need to review something or you miss something um, and share the word with others, please. Go to our My Extension 210 YouTube channel and subscribe. And we have a lot of great information there. And hopefully uh, you all learned a little bit today. And we always want to remember, learn and have fun. That is my email address. Please don't hesitate to send me any gardening or landscape questions. If you need something identified, send a quality image, please. Not part of the email but uh, as attached to the email and we'll get it answered as best we can. And thank you and have a great day.